Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of All Access with me. And uh, we're at the end of another exciting week. And I want to just chat with you very briefly about the big happenings in the Avalanche ecosystem and also crypto at large. So uh, let's get started. I'm coming to you today from Istanbul, Turkey. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm at an Airbnb here. Uh, waiting out a uh, five-day uh, quarantine, following a lot of meetings with a lot of uh, young, energetic people here uh, at the hackathon. But more on that later. Let's uh, let's let's get up to speed and uh, cover the various things that we need to cover. So let me first uh, present here, um, and uh, hang on. We're going to do it with the screen share. And uh, here we go. And there we go. So there's a lot to say. And uh, let's get into it. The very first and very big thing that happened in the, in the last week or so was the announcement that we would be fractionalizing and uh, selling, or some people would be fractionalizing and selling a very iconic piece of art. This is the, uh, the piece of art known as Love is in the Air. And uh, I remember this because this was the very first Banksy I ever saw. It was, I think it was in the mid 80s that Banksy was beginning to emerge. He was this anonymous figure and he was this disruptive figure. And uh, he would appear out of nowhere and uh, would just paint some stuff uh, on, uh, on the streets in, uh, in Bristol, I think he was, uh, and later on all around the UK. And uh, these were iconic pieces. These were touching pieces. These were unexpected pieces that just appeared and were part of the, of the, of the surroundings. And nobody had to pay to see these Banksy's. They didn't have value. They, had, they were invaluable. And, um, and of course, there was a lot of speculation about who Banksy was. And it was this iconic, amazing figure. Not unlike another iconic, amazing figure, Satoshi Nakamoto. Nobody knows who Satoshi is. A lot of people think they have some ideas exactly the same for Banksy. A lot of people think Banksy is known and then you say, who do you think it is? They give you a name and everybody else gives you a different name. And, uh, and Satoshi, just like Banksy, is, was disruptive. So what better thing than, uh, than to bring these two universes together? So Banksy ended up uh, selling Love is in the Air, or rather uh, this last Banksy, uh, this, this Banksy, well, I can't even speak properly today. This, uh, this piece, the Love is in the Air piece, was sold for 12.9 million dollars if i'm not mistaken and uh, ultimately it's been acquired by a project known as particle and what they plan to do is to divide it into uh, 10,000 pieces 100 by 100 and uh, to offer the ownership of those pieces uh, on the avalanche blockchain so you and i and everybody we know can own this piece of art and uh, owning a, a piece of this Banksy allows you to go and see it wherever it might be getting displayed. There are various different rights associated with it. It's a different model for art ownership. And, uh, and there's a lot, as, as, as is always the case, there's a lot that it surfaces. There's a lot of debates and discussions to be had. Who should own art? Should art be owned at all? Should art be something that is sold for enormous you know, multi-million dollar sums? These are all valid questions. And uh, uh, so, uh, it's not my place to uh, to answer them, uh, but personally, if you know, I believe that if the premise is yes, we do need to compensate our artists, and therefore art does get to to be sold, then I think from my perspective and from my value system, it's much better for that art to be owned by the collective than to be owned by one rich wealthy whale. So I would much rather see this in the hands of ten thousand of my closest friends, as opposed to just one some just some some one random person. So um, this Banksy is going to be up for auction sometime in, in, uh, in the early uh, next year. And uh, that picture over there is Beeple. He came by. He is the person who sold the uh, most expensive NFT. That NFT, I think, got sold on a, on a blockchain that is not as nice to the environment as Avalanche is. So I'm really excited that we're doing Banksy. I'm really excited that Banksy gets to be owned by... Uh, lots and lots of people, and I'm really excited that it's happening on a green, uh, sustainable chain. So I'm super thrilled, and also my life seems to be kind of folding in on itself. So, uh, so I'm I'm going back to think to people that I first met when I was 15, people that I was in awe of, and it's just there's nothing on earth 
as satisfying as seeing those very same people's work uh, getting integrated into the things that you have built later on. So I'm thrilled and uh, I'll be in line when this thing is uh, is being auctioned off. And uh, and I'm so looking forward to uh, to, to following it and, and going and seeing it wherever it might be. Second big announcement from uh, just two days ago. Dexalot went online. I've been talking to a lot of different people over the years saying, look, there is much more to Dexes than what you have seen. You guys know Uniswap. You guys know Pangolin. You guys know Trader Joe. Uh, you guys know YetiSwap. You guys know the the uh, the AMM-based uh, DEXs, you, you know, the traditional DEXs that one sees. DEXalot is a new DEX. It's different from the, the old lot, and uh, it just went online. On the night it went online, I think there ended up being about $200,000 worth of trades. So that's a very, very, very tiny sliver of volume, but it is, after all, their, their debut night. I am thrilled about DEXalot, and uh, there are a couple of reasons for why I'm, I'm thrilled. Dexalot is different. It's not an AMM. When you use an AMM, like Uniswap version 2 or any of these other ones that I mentioned, then what happens is every motion, every move you make, every trade you make with the AMM is a, is a trade that you make against the, the pool. So there isn't a counterparty. It's not like you and I are trading against each other on Uniswap. Instead, what's happening is Uniswap has these liquidity pools and I sell into the pool or I buy from the pool. The pool offers a price that is updated every time somebody buys and sells. And arbitrageurs are constantly doing that to, uh, to take advantage of pricing differences. Now, um, because the underlying exchange is not bringing two different people, there is not a meeting of the minds happening at the exchange. Instead, there's an automatically updated price as part of the liquidity pool. The, uh, the trades necessarily come with slippage. And the bigger the trade, the greater the slippage. If you buy a lot of some token, you will move its price. And uh, the price that you get is not going to be potentially the best price. And um, because it's not a constant price, it depends on how big, how much you trade. Uh, further, if you want to set up something like a limit order, then you can't. There's only the pool and there is no mechanism by which you can say, hey, I want to buy this thing when it hits, you know, whatever it is, like when it hits... Uh, you know, it's like 10 bucks right now when it goes down to eight bucks then fill my order you cannot do that with these uh these uh, these amm based uh dexes so one thing one something that people can do is uh use uniswap version 3. Uh, v3 was introduced to address some of these and uh, the core idea there is to have is to provide liquidity in different bands and so that's kind of like limit orders, but kind of totally not like limit orders. It's, it's an odd, odd beast. It's, it's in a sense kind of like a limit order because if you are providing liquidity in a range, then you're agreeing to trade when the stock or when the item, the ticker is in that range. So that's good, but it's a double-sided order. You can't say, buy me this thing when the price hits as low as you know $8 um, without also saying, sell this thing as it's moving up out of that zone. So you, you end up providing liquidity. You end up providing volume for both the buys and the sells as long as the price is in the range that you determine. That's a very complex order. I just, I still, even to this day, it's been a while since uh, V3 has been introduced, uh, almost almost a year, I think a couple, a couple months shy of a year. And I still don't know how to sort of wrap my mind around what my thesis ought to be when I use V3. Am I, am I long? I'm not long. Am I short? I'm not that. It's kind of like a reverse butterfly. I'm saying essentially, I believe the stock, this, uh, this ticker, this item, this asset will trade in this band. And that's a bizarre thing to say. And, uh, and I'm much more comfortable with directional calls. I, can, I think I can say something like, you know, a box will go up from here or, you know, this token is, is overvalued. It'll go down from there. That I know how to pronounce. But, uh, but providing uh, the V3 type uh, trades, it's just not something that I am personally used to. So that's been kind of odd. And, uh, and I, I haven't been using V3 at all. I've never touched it actually as a result because I can't really understand the, the investment thesis that goes into it. But um, Dexalot is exactly like 
uh, the, uh, the, the traditional exchanges that everybody is used to. It's really just a meeting of the minds where somebody's saying, hey, buy this thing at this price. And the other one is saying, sell this thing at, the, at this other price. And it internally implements uh, an order book. And there's a bunch of bid orders and a bunch of ask orders. There is a spread and uh, people come in potentially with limit orders of their own or with market orders and uh, they execute against the book, against other standing orders in the book. It's uh, very straightforward and, um, and it's wonderful uh, to have it online because it allows us to implement a bunch of things very efficiently. If I am willing to sell my token at, let's say, $9 and you want to buy it at $9, then you can execute that trade without slippage. I was happy at nine, you're happy at nine. With, a, with an AMM, I would have had to sell into the, the, uh, the, the, the liquidity pool and you would have had to buy it from there and both of those trades would exercise slippage. If I have a lot of tokens to sell, if somebody is doing a token sale, then they can do it at, uh, it's, it's something according to whatever the structure is that they've determined using uh, the Dexalot infrastructure. This is also awesome. And, um, and then third and most importantly, if, uh, if there is a new token, nobody knows how much it should trade at, well then Dexalot can be used to determine to, to the, the price. It can be used for price discovery. Open it up, uh, keep the books sort of uh, ready and allow people to populate it with orders of their own. And, uh, and then you can come in and, and, uh, and establish whatever it is that you wanna do. If there is a, an IDO, um, what you can do is make it happen on, on Dexalot and you will see the bidding take place. And uh, whoever is offering the tokens, the IDO, can then sell into the established order book at, uh, at the time of their own choosing. So this is all fantastic new uh, finance Legos. And um, it's uh, not possible, as far as I understand it, to execute Dexalot on another chain like, uh, like Ethereum because it is an expensive operation to do this, to, to keep track of all these things. And uh, the gas prices there are incredibly high. Uh, but in contrast, Avalanche is ticking along and, uh, uh, and it's, it's in entirely feasible to use it. And, um, and I'm really proud that we have yet another item in our arsenal that is not possible or available elsewhere. So I'm really thrilled that we have this uh, on Avalanche. Um, they are doing a staged launch. So it's not it's not entirely open right now. The only they're they're only supporting one pair of Ox to USDT, I think. Um, so uh, so if you go there, you're not going to see a you know a whole collection of of assets to trade right today. Uh, but over the coming weeks, they're going to open it up. The vision here is that you should be able to trade anything without slippage using complicated limit orders. So that's a fan fantastic vision. And uh, this is one of the very few places where you can do this uh, very, very effectively. Uh, Dexalot is non-custodial. For those of you who are afraid of exchanges stealing your coins and so forth, Dexalot is, uh, uh, is, is, uh, is all on-chain. There is nobody who takes custody of your coins. You can take them unilaterally. It's all smart contract based. So check it out, give it a go, kick the tires a little bit. Let's make it even better. Uh, or to the extent that we can, there's, I'm sure, a lot of improvements to be done. And, uh, and uh, let's see how it, how it pans out. Okay, speaking of, uh, of uh, exchanges and, uh, and revolutionary new DEXs, let's talk a little bit about fees on Avalanche. As you know, fees on Avalanche are very, very low. We're very, very proud of this fact. They're low because the chain has high capacity. When the chain is high capacity, then it can accommodate the natural uh, flux of uh, orders that are happening because people are trying to essentially, uh, essentially update all these AMMs and so forth. If you have a low capacity chain, just these bots that are trading against the AMMs that are trying to do arbitrage and so forth, consume all the capacity there is. And then you and I and everybody we know, as we try to get into that chain, well, then the fees start spiking up. If you're top speed is 15 transactions per second, and there are 14 TPS worth of bot activity, then you and I will have to fight each other to the nail to be that last one transaction to get in there and carry out something economically useful. So that's what you see play out on other chains. 
But Avalanche is different. It has far more capacity. And we saw this capacity actually um, play itself out um, in the last few weeks. So um, so I do want to say one thing about, about fee expectations, though. Just because you have a high capacity chain does not mean that you will forever have and always have low fees. There might be moments when everybody is piling onto the chain. And the only thing and the only right thing to do then is to push back on that on that load by raising the fees momentarily as that load is coming in. So if somebody sets up a game on chain that is giving out a lot of value, then it's normal and natural for people to jump in to extract that value. And as they do so, and as they clamor, you know, over you know, they jump over each other to try to get at that value, they will drive the fees up. This is true no matter how high the capacity of the underlying chain is. So there will be moments on Avalanche when the fees spike, especially around IDOs. If uh, so people are using AMMs, they're using Pangolin or Trader Joe to give out a million dollars worth of coins, let's say. The very first person to trade into that AMM is going to get a very low price because the AMM doesn't know what the price of the coin ought to be. It has to do market discovery. And the market discovery happens by selling these coins. And so at the very first people to get in get a great price. And so to get that great price on the tokens, they're willing to spend a lot of money. So if I'm going to get, let's say, a million dollars worth of free cash, I'm, I'm ready to spend up to $900,000 in fees. And that's exactly what we see around IDOs that are designed this way. So that's the dynamic that's spiking the, the, um, the, the fees on occasion. And uh, I tried to describe this a couple of weeks ago. And uh, since then, I reached out and we will try to eliminate these kinds of activities. The fact that we have DEX a lot now means that uh, we can use it to do price discovery ahead of time and give the benefit of that price discovery to the people selling their tokens instead of causing those, uh, those, uh, those, uh, uh, those bids to be consumed in the form of transaction fees in the network. And, uh, and then also at the same time cause congestion on the network. So, um, so you might see occasional spikes, they're normal. What you should also see are uh, rapid pullbacks once the load is gone. And uh, in general, the fees should be low uh, because we have such a high capacity chain. And um, ever since the changes that we made a few weeks ago, this is exactly the dynamic that we've been seeing. And I'm really proud of the engineering team's reparameterization on that front. I told you that we had already solved the hard scientific problems, and uh, there are some, many actually, engineering problems ahead of us, and this is one of them. And uh, we've taken the first stab. We will likely have to take other stabs as well, but we're at a very, very good spot when it comes to transaction fees. They're very low right now, and uh, these occasional spikes we can only eliminate by changing the game that's being played, and we're introducing the very tools by which we can change those games. So I'm really thrilled about where we are and uh, really thrilled about what is to come later. Okay, and uh, here's another thing I'm thrilled about. So the reason why I'm here in Istanbul and uh, why I wasn't at Art Basel in Miami is because we ended up holding a giant hackathon here. And I'm really thrilled about what I, what I saw. So I flew out here, uh, I guess maybe about seven days ago or so. And uh, this is the very first, or it's, I'm told that it's not the very first, but it's certainly the first major hackathon on, uh, centered on blockchains. We had about um, 500 applicants, out of which we selected 150. Uh, they worked night and day for two and a half days, and uh, they built uh, about 18 different projects. Actually, some of the projects are a little bit more involved, so they had sub-projects underneath. It becomes a, a, a little bit hard to count when you have so many energetic people coming up with so many cool ideas. But it was a fantastic, fantastic place. Uh, we saw some of, the, some of the key players whose uh, work we had seen before, some of, some of, you, some of whom you know from Twitter and so forth. And, um, but much more importantly, I saw many different faces, many new faces from all over. And uh, it's just amazing to see this. And I'm really proud that I did not go to Art Basel. Yeah, I did not get to see the excitement around uh, Banksy, but instead came here to spend my time with these energetic teams building new things. And I'm also proud that Avalab sponsored this event and gave out uh, around $100,000 
in uh, prizes. And uh, this is, just for context, happening at a time when wherever you look, you see ads from exchanges. Exchanges are trying to come into this particular market as they are trying to get into every, every juicy market. You look around the US, all of the arenas are full of, uh, of exchange names. Uh, look around Europe, you see ads for various different ways by which you can buy uh, cryptocurrencies. But it hurts me deep inside that people are, are focusing on the trading aspect of cryptocurrencies and not on the building aspect. So um, we, uh, we ended up putting our time and, uh, and some of our money where it counts, which is fostering a, a new generation of people who are, who are building things that take advantage of the magic of blockchains. I'm really proud of the, the this was a gaming oriented uh, hackathon. I'm really proud of the artwork that I saw. I'm really proud of the games that I saw. I just generally was very proud of the scene, of the vibe, of the collaborative environment that I saw. So um, we plan to repeat this uh, all across the globe. And so I hope to come to a gorgeous city near you and, um, and spend some time uh, interacting with you, trying to figure out who you are, what you want to build, and hopefully uh, helping you uh, with that endeavor. So uh, let's see what else is happening. Avalanche is growing. It's, uh, it's growing in leaps and bounds. Um, there are some metrics that I, I knew off, off the top of my head maybe a few hours ago, but then I did a nice, nice walk by the Bosphorus and uh, I don't remember them, but, um, but the, uh, the growth in Avalanche is amazing. It's exponential. So anybody who's sitting on top of, uh, of this kind of growth back in during the internet era would have been one of the big stars. And in fact, you know, that's one of the reasons why Avalanche is a, is a shining star right now. So um, the uh, all time, all time, we have an all time high gas usage. So this is far more than Ethereum's usage per day. So there's more activity on Avalanche per day than there is on Ethereum. So let that sink in. This thing is high capacity. It's doing things. There's a lot of economic activity. TVL is growing. So Avalanche is the number three uh, chain in terms of total value lot. And this is without liquid staking. When liquid staking comes in, it's going to grow even more. And um, so number one is Ethereum, of course. There's a lot of value there. Number two is Binance Smart Chain. And, um, and so Avalanche is number three after that. And I would say Avalanche is the number two fully decentralized chain. So Avalanche has uh, more than a thousand validators and, uh, and, and countless uh, participants. Uh, and uh, it's, it's not a centrally controlled chain. I'm really proud of this. This is amazing growth and it's still going on, uh, thanks in part to the fast chain it offers underneath and thanks in part to the bridge and the bridge experience that's seamless, cheap and quick. And uh, keep in mind that the smart contract chain, the C chain and Avalanche is just one of the many things Avalanche can do. Avalanche can introduce other blockchains it can introduce new subnets. And uh, so that's the topic I want to come back to. Um, but, uh, but just this one thing it can do, it already does at a level that's globally competitive with the best in that game. This is the, uh, the number of daily transactions. I think it's 700,000. You can see that growth curve. It is just amazing. So these are true value bearing transactions. And it's really great to be having uh, to be to be to be involved in a system that's being used so much, that's bringing so much value to people. Okay, uh, what else is happening? There is this. Uh, I think maybe a week ago there was a funny moment, and uh, and there was uh, you know there's news of a new strain of COVID, and that caused a sell-off for some reason, and this created some. It was a very funny tweet from uh, from Sam. I think uh, a lot of us were scratching our heads. In general, these kinds of lockdowns have been great for crypto. So last year, we found out that, 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 uh, that the lockdowns actually meant that there was more activity. And somehow this time around, uh, it ended up doing the exact opposite. So it's really one of these head scratch moments. And, um, and you just got to wonder what's going on uh, inside the market. You know, actually, we can know what's going on because of portfolio theory, there's some linkages and usually what happens is when there's negative news that affects one market 
and takes that down, in this case equities, um, then usually because uh, actors have conjoined uh, uh, portfolios, uh, a drawdown in one area means that they have to sell uh, resources, assets in another area. And that's why you see this kind of an effect in the short term. In the slightly longer term, once, once people address their immediate capital needs, the, then the natural cause and effect should kick in and people should get their wits about and be like, okay, well, that was, uh, that was that. But moving forward, the thesis is crypto will be increased crypto activity. So I'm still quite bullish. It's a really exciting time. And uh, going into this winter, uh, I think we are poised for a lot of growth. Uh, there is so much excitement around this area. I mentioned some of it before, first that I saw personally. I'm seeing more of it now. I'm getting more inquiries from institutional investors than I ever have been. So uh, it's just a great time overall. And uh, I think that wraps it up. There were a bunch of other things that happened as well. We had the Senate hearings on crypto and my colleagues, especially Brian Brooks, did a fantastic job of, um, of uh, reiterating our position and uh, getting the point across to lawmakers that this is an area of great technological growth and uh, it's an area of innovation and it's an area that's bringing um, a lot of uh, financial inclusion, financial opportunities to various different regions of the world. Speaking of which, I am so thrilled that with the presence of Avalanche, um, large swaths of the, of the world geography can now experience DeFi. So case in point, uh, most people in, in this country right now that I'm in uh, had not been able to participate in Ethereum's DeFi environment because the fees were so high. And now they can, and that's exactly the growth that we've been seeing. And uh, this is a pattern all across the globe. So we need cheaper chains, we need higher capacity chains, we need flexible chains. And I'm really, really thrilled that we have the technology to meet those demands uh, from, uh, from all sorts of places around the world. So with that, I'm going to uh, wrap up today's uh, episode and uh, take a nice stroll down and uh, enjoy the city. And, um, and once my quarantine is done, I'm, I look forward to uh, visiting some relatives here. And um, as for you all, keep safe, have fun, and uh, let's uh, look forward to a very, very exciting uh, months ahead. Thank you.